So you um, <clears throat> already got a feel from the first few chapters that um, you know <clears throat> there sometimes there's a kind of big gap between what you can do theoretically and what you can do practically, um, and that sometimes is sort of even painful to you know make that that gap. Um, well, and this is, we haven't really talked about any real real word problems that people do and, um, you know, sort of for a living. Um, but uh, this chapter, chapter four, um, I mean, anyway, it's geared in that direction, but it's, of course, not, uh, <clears throat> not the final answer. I mean, the, the story is, again, complex. As I said, each chapter takes not one, but maybe two or three, uh, you know, graduate courses to actually become sort of proficient in in uh, in, in those techniques. Um, I mean, in the, te in the techniques that are used, you know, like for for um, you know real world applications nowadays, for instance, or at any given time. So you can uh, pursue a PhD in each of these topics if you like. And get uh, get an expert. Um, so, uh, with that with that in mind, just what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, for some sort of simplified problems, some you know simple uh, looking problems. How can we um, no longer rely on say symbolic capabilities of of computers, but rather Kind of try to approximate solutions that we, you know, desired solutions by, you know, some sort of systematic, um, and by, by some systematic uh, methods, and um, we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, um, line search methods. Which are intrinsically 1D. So that's sort of the first, the first thing to talk about. And then we're going to talk about um, gradient method. Um, and <coughs> gradient methods. That's. Um, um, in any dimensions, and also conjugate gradient methods. Uh, conjugate, yeah, conjugate gra gradient methods. Of course. <clears throat> and this is all unconstrained optimization. So the uh, picture here is that you have. You want to minimize a function, so unconstrained optimization. But as you saw, even if we're in constrained optimizations, sometimes it's just hard to solve. So seek x star such that the gradient is zero. Even this exercise might be, I'm sorry, the gradient equals zero. Even this might be a difficult task. Okay, so it might not be possible to do that. So. Um, Many times it is easiest to approximate x star <coughs> by a sequence x1, x2, x3, xk, xk plus 1. And that's, you know, 
computationally that's uh, feasible. That is, you start with some initial value, and that could be a problem uh, already, how to pick the initial value. But then you could kind of get closer and closer to that, a little bit like the simplex method, but not just, uh, just uh, as an analogy. And then at some point you would stop. You would say, well, I either found the... <coughs> So uh, computationally, one needs an initial guess, say x0. And again, this, this may be vectors. <coughs> and a stopping criterion. Um, and there are no single. I mean, there there are several stop. There are several uh, stopping criteria. The one that I think the book uses is if the gradient <coughs> is uh, in magnitude of some of less than or equal than some prescribed uh, epsilon. And by this we mean the could be sort of the just the length, like the square of the sum of the squares. So, for instance, this is the one that we're going to be. Um, it's it's most often used, but um, <clears throat> why is an initial guess problematic sometimes? Well, note that if there are several um, local minimum, for instance, that is, <clears throat> you know, the gradient has um, several solution, maxima, minima or maxima. But <clears throat> if you have the gradient equal to zero and several points that are minima, you know, they could, if you look at the graph of the function, so let's say this is the graph of f. So I have a minimum here and I have a minimum here, right? This is where the gradient equal to zero. And of course, I have some other points, saddle points. Let's say there's a saddle point here. <clears throat> um, and you look for, for one of them, then of course you want to <clears throat> be able to start close, somewhere close to this and kind of go towards that uh, x star through this algorithm. But if you start sort of <clears throat> in a far away from this, I mean, you don't know where, where this thing is, right? If you start far away from it through this, let's say, stupid descent method, you may actually end up with a different solution. Um, there are rare cases when you actually end up with a sort of a settle point. <clears throat> but so the finding the initial guess sort of is um, requires some knowledge of the global picture, so that when you look for the minimum, you know uh, that you're actually getting a minimum. You know, imagine that this this minimum value is much lower. Then you find a local minimum, but you don't find a global minimum, and you have no way of knowing that, you know, far away there is there is a point where it's actually a, a lower minimum. Okay, so this these are all issues that uh, in practice one one faces. But <coughs> how do you actually um, move from from one step to the next one? How do you generate this sequence? So, of course, 
most importantly uh, is to describe how to generate xk plus 1 from xk, for instance. Okay? How do you generate the next one? <clears throat> Say you have an initial guess, how do you generate x1, and then how do you generate x2, and how do you uh, continue that way? Okay? So the first thing is, let's talk about 1D. And it's called, um, in 1D, I have a function, so x is real. I have a function of one variable, right? Is to be minimized. And the picture may look something like this, right? <coughs> So you may have a local, again, you may have a local minimum You may have several points where, the, um, where, where you have a local minimum but you only have a global minimum How do you find such a, such a point? Of course, if F is smooth that corresponds to derivative equal to zero. So smooth means we ha we we have derivatives, uh, the first derivative at least, and the first derivative is continuous. <coughs> then um, the global minimum satisfies the derivative equal to zero. Again, it's not even cl clear how you can actually take the derivative. If if the function is given to you, how do you take the derivative? And how do you set it equal to zero? How do you how do you find solutions symbolically, right? So it has to be done uh, by approximating. So uh, let's see. There are a few <clears throat> there are a few tools to do that. Um, I mean, the book talks about several of them. I mean, I, I'm not going to... Um, give you too many. Um, I, I want to talk about this golden section method. So I'm going to put it here also that the sec if I have a second derivative at a minimum point, that has to be non-negative. Right? So one of them is the um, golden ratio or section method. <clears throat> and here's, here's sort of the idea. Uh, the idea is, imagine, let's say, an interval, on some interval a0, b0, that I have to minimize a function. Okay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to um, reduce the uh, length of this interval at each iteration by a fixed ratio. Okay. So Um, choose choose A1 and B1 such that and of course in the interval A0, B0 such that the ratio of A1 minus A0 equals the ratio of B naught, well, okay, equals the ratio of B naught minus B one 
equals rho times B naught minus A naught. So let's see on the on the picture. Okay, where rho is less than a half. So this so on the picture it looks like this. So you have A one here. And I have B1 here. So <clears throat> just ignore the B. So just A1. So how do we pick A1? We pick A1 so that A1 minus A0, this length, is a fraction less than a half than the big length. Okay? And then we do the same with B1 on the other side. Now, of course, if, if this row were a half, then you would find one, the midpoint. And I think there is also um, I mean that, that could also be, in principle, a way to, uh, to, to look for the minimum, but this actually turns out to be a little bit more efficient. Um, OK? So again. This length is, 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 a, is a fraction less than a half than the entire length, and then the same is here. Okay? And now what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna, <clears throat> to we're gonna say the following. If the value of the function f at this new point is less than the value of the function f, uh, a1 is less than the value of the function f at b, f b1. Okay? Then we can conclude then the minimum of f is achieved in the interval a naught b1. Why is that? I'm sorry, I, I, I missed to. So what's, I mean, this picture is not very illustrative here. I think this, that's that's a general. It's not. It's not the. Of course, it's not depending on the picture. But um, let's see. Why is this true? Yeah, what if, uh, what if uh, f of b naught is lower than all? If f of b naught, that, that, that's my question too. If f of b naught is yeah, I think f of a naught has to be less than f of b naught somehow. That that's sort of my. Well, hold on, hold on, because it says also if f of a1 is greater than f of b1, then uh, the minimum is in the interval a1 b0. Let's see if we can reconcile that.
assuming the function is continuous. Yes, function is, is smooth. In the first case, in this case, you mean? Right. Um, or the slope is positive. Uh, positive, right. That's positive. Right. Yes. yes, positive. So the gradient, if you will, is to the left. And... Uh, Also, you know that there is a negative gradient, is that it? It's quite OK. Well, I thought, I thought it would, um, let's say I thought it was obvious, but now no, I don't see that. I mean, you have to know that the minimum is inside of the interval A0, A B0, so that you can actually continue the search. Um, if you do that, OK. All right, OK, so let, let, let me, uh, OK. So it's not that, that I mean, you may have minimum in the sudden interval too. But what we're doing is we're restricting our, our search in the left, sort of in the left end, okay? And we are guaranteed to actually find, I mean, there is a minimum, right? In each, in each closed interval, there is a minimum, okay? So there will be a minimum, and because f of a1 is less than f of b1, Right? This says let us suppose the minimum is attained at a point in the interval over here. So I'm not sure if that makes a difference or not. No, but I mean think about think about it like this. So so I'm gonna have several minimum, right? In this interval. In this in this interval. Now Take the interval A0, B1, okay? A1 is, an in, is, a, is a point in here, right? That has a lower value than, than, than the value at, F of, at, at, at this end point, right? I don't know about this other end point, right? But that means that the minimum, there's going to be a minimum in this interval, right? That's also going to be a minimum for the entire function on the entire interval, okay? So the idea is that you actually reduce the size of the, of the interval you're searching, and you're comparing the values of, of f at those points that you're generating, so that you're narrowing down to a minimum, okay? It may not be a global minimum, okay? It may not be a global minimum. Same here, <clears throat> so it just, by comparing this value of the function at two intermediate points, you just know which way to go, left or right. I mean, which, which, which way to restrict, left or right, okay? So we're not, we're not looking for a global minimum. We're just looking for um, sort of a minimum. So the minimum So I should, I should say then a local minimum for f of x is achieved here and so is here. Okay? And then we continue the search. But the key is how do we actually go to the next one? So say 
uh, the interval is, say we pick a naught b1. Okay? So the picture looks looks like this. So f of a1 is less than f of b1. So we, now we pick this new interval, which is which is this one, right? Now we're going to do the same once again. That is, we're going to take same ratio. <coughs> we're going to generate two points, right? And the trick is now to actually have a1 to be part of the next generation. So basically to have a1 to equal to b2 so that you do this and then you do another one over here. Okay. So the next one would be to say that I have a2 and a1 equals b2. Okay. And why, why that? Because you've already computed the value of the function at that point. So you don't have to evaluate at two new points. Okay. And then, of course, you would then evaluate the function at f of a2, and you would compare it with this previous value. Right? If it's smaller, you're going to pick this interval. If, it's, if, it's, if, if at this point is bigger, we're going to pick this interval. Okay? So in the next step, iteration, we want to have uh, B2 to be equal to A1. So the picture looks, as I said, like this. Then I have some intermediate A1, B1. And now I want this to be equal to, and now I want this, this length to be basically the same. <clears throat> so I want B2, B2 minus B1, which is A1 minus B1. I want that here to be equal to rho times b1 minus a naught. Okay. Well, <clears throat> because of this constraint that you want to impose in, in choosing this uh, second iteration to be already coincide with something you've already computed, and using the same ratio, uh, turns out. So let's see. It turns out that this row has to have a specific value. That's the golden ratio. Um, Your choice here is that only for the first case where function a1 was greater than function b1? Just for the first case, yeah. Now I'm just generating the, the next points. And of course, then we're going to have to decide which way I go, left or right. <coughs> but let's um, so again the ratio between these two kind of arrows that I should be row right that's what I wrote that's about what I wrote here and if you now uh, look at what is b1 minus a1 so this should have been I'm sorry this should have been b I'm sorry, B1 minus B2, and just to be positive. B1 minus B2, and this is B1 minus A2. Okay? Hmm? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's B1 minus A1. Okay. Um, all right, so now let's say, well, what was B1 minus A0? <clears throat> this was 1 minus, Yeah, it's 1 minus rho times b naught minus a naught. So remember that, so this to here is, one, is, is basically the complement of this interval in the, in the large interval, right? And this, this interval was rho times the, the big interval. So it's basically 1 minus rho times b naught minus a naught. 
Okay. So far, so good. I mean, it's, it's just bookkeeping, basically. Um, and now, I guess now is the other way around. So now you should say that B one minus B two. No. Now you should say that <clears throat> A one minus A naught. This was rho A naught minus B naught, right? That's from the previous step. A not A one minus A naught is the same rho over B naught minus A naught. Okay, so let's see. So now take a look at this guy, B one minus A one. B1 minus A1 is okay. Okay, here's what I want to get. I want to get to B1 minus A1. B1 minus B2 is one minus two rho B naught minus A naught. Let's just see if we if we can agree on that. Yeah, because what? Because this one in the middle is the big interval minus twice those two interval, those two, right? It's probably not the best best way, right? So everybody agrees. The one in the middle <clears throat> is the big interval minus twice rho times the big interval, right? Because you pick those two intervals to be uh, fr fr fraction rho from the from the big interval. So when you put this together, this and this, you get a quadratic equation in row which row squared minus three row plus one equals zero gives you row to be three minus square root of five over two, which is zero point three eight two and one minus rho is um, square root of five minus one over two. I mean, this is really the golden ratio: six one eight zero three. Okay. Well, <clears throat> this number is not a coincidence. It's basically just. Uh, the number that satisfies this relation so if you have a the way I like to think about it is if you have a window like this um, the ratio of Let's see the shortest side. What what's the the, sh the ratio between the lo lo the, the uh, um, shorter side to the longer side? Okay, is the same as the ratio between sort of the longer side and the sum of the two. So if this is width and this is length, and this would be the width over length is the length over width plus length. And this is just the golden ratio that uh, if you go home and you measure your windows, what you'll find, your typical window. It's like three feet by five feet, but it's not quite three feet is not quite five feet, it's just a little bit less, 
when you do that ratio, it's, it comes out to be pretty much the golden ratio, <clears throat> which makes you wonder um, why they pick 3 by 5 to be sort of the ubiquitous um, ratio. Anyway, so that's, that number, 0 0.618, uh, you know, people in elementary school probably learn about it, this number. Um, so, in our case, this ratio is chosen to actually just make the evaluation of the function at the next step to be sort of necessary only at one additional point. So each iteration is going to make you evaluate the function at one additional point instead of two. Okay? And if you continue this, Um, if you continue this, then what you're going to do is, as k goes to, well, so you're going to generate, so, um, so this procedure will generate, you know, a not a1, a2, and B naught, B1, B2, okay? And uh, the the length of, it, of the interval containing the minimum at well, x star will have length to be, uh, I think, 1 minus rho to the power k times the length of the initial interval. So it's going to be sort of decreasing. And usually you stop where the length of the interval has reached a certain um, threshold or a certain small number epsilon okay so stopping criteria is when um, you know this number is less than some epsilon delta Let's put a delta for some prescribed delta. Okay. Now, this is, I mean, <clears throat> this is by far the only um, way to actually gener to find the minimum. Um, there's this sort of fixed search, so other uh, <clears throat> search methods are um, possible, of course. Um, there's this fixed uh, step you can actually go you know, you start at some point, t naught, or, or um, t naught, and then you go t1, tk, tk plus 1, and you do this as long as f of tk is less, until f of tk is less than f to tk plus 1. So stop when f of tk is tk plus 1. So this would be tk plus 1 is tk plus some fixed h. So you go to the right, and as, as long as you decrease, you keep going. When you start back increasing, you stop, and then you go back, or back um, with a smaller time step. So then go back, that is to the left with 
a smaller time step and so forth. So now depending on the function it's I mean no, no single method is I mean it really depends on the function which method gives you a better uh, or a faster uh, convergence to the minimum on the line right so that's not um, there's there are also what are called the uh, I mean there's there's this family of Newton methods which you probably have seen um, but again in some cases that Newton's method is no good um, majority of cases is good um, I mean, it leads you to a, to a convergence, but it may not be the best method. Um, there is also, so this is fixed, fixed, uh, fixed step. Um, there is also what's called Fibonacci. Let's see, Fibonacci method just <coughs> uh, would be sort of a similar method to the, uh, uh, to the golden ratio, um, except now you're changing the ratio at each step. So it's not a fixed ratio that you, you create, but it's, a, it's a, a variable ratio. And let me just say the following is that so similar to golden ratio search method but um, with ratio changing at each, at each iteration and this is actually a smarter way to do it of course um, so the relation is not uh, that you use a fixed ratio row, but at each, I mean, at the next time step, you're actually picking sort of row to to satisfy this this relation. And zero less than row k plus one less than one half. <coughs> and how do you pick this? So um, row k plus one says one minus two row k over one minus row k, and that's one minus row k over one minus row k. Okay. So you can see that 1 minus rho k plus 1 equals rho k over 1 minus rho k. So this, this was the length that by which the next interval is smaller, I mean the ratio uh, by which the next interval is smaller than the previous interval, right? So the um, so after n iterations, the interval search interval has length. 1 minus row 1, 1 minus row 2, 1 minus row, say, n. So what you'd like is to have this. So the idea of picking row k is that to minimize this product. <clears throat> you want to minimize after any iterations you want to have the smallest possible interval of course at the expense of you have to evaluate uh, possibly the function at, at more than more than uh, one point at two points at each at each uh, iteration 
uh, minimize this subject to rho k, you know, 1 minus rho k plus 1 is rho k over 1 minus rho k. So you're going to pick the next, like the last one here, you're going to have to pick it so that to minimize this product subject to, to this constraints. <coughs> and it turns, I mean, actually, this is a minimization problem on its own. Oh, and of course, 0 less than rho k and less, less than 1 over 1 half. And this... Uh, turns out to be the following. So, talking about minimization problems, um, so let me put one minus one minus rho one. So that that ratio one minus rho one, which is the factor by which the interval is reduced. The first iteration is is basically. in terms of these Fibonacci numbers. And what are the Fibonacci numbers? So where Fk is the Fibonacci sequence that satisfies uh, Fk plus 1 is the sum of the previous two, Fk plus Fk minus 1. So it's just a recursion relation. You can actually find the solutions of these. So Fk is, and you have to solve the um, I don't have the expression here, but it's r squared equals r, squ r plus 1, right? r squared minus r minus 1 equals 0 r is one half square root of five over two plus or minus, right? So you can, I mean, there is a, <coughs> of course, there is a formula for um, cn one plus square root of five over two to the n plus dn one minus square root of five over two which also involves the golden ratio, <clears throat> but uh, that's just as a curiosity, I guess. Um, f of 0 is 1, f of 1 is 1. So you start with the first to be equal to 1. And that would determine what C, I'm sorry, just C, C and D, C and D are. So F2 is going to be 2, F3 is going to be three but f four is five and so on, right? So it's a little bit uh, it's a it's a little bit more com I mean it is a more complicated method, but the idea is the same that you kind of depending on how many steps you wanna go, like if you wanna <clears throat> if you wanna minimize the uh this if you want to complete the search, get within a uh, epsilon interval up to n iterations, then you're going to start with sort of these ratios. Okay? And you're going to do that search uh, using that, those specified ratios. I'm sorry, this was F1 over F2, so it's so, for instance, the last the last one is going to be exactly one half. Okay. Of course, the farther you are, I think the turns out that in the limit, <coughs> again as a curiosity, uh, as n goes to infinity, f n over f n plus one goes to the golden ratio.
So in fact, which is 0 0.6 and something. So 6, 1. Okay, so when you do this search, what you start this you start with a rate with a with a ratio that's very close to that golden ratio, and then you kind of make it bigger and bigger and, until it gets to you go away from that ratio until you get to a half. Okay, but again, you have to kind of plan ahead and say, well, I want to get with this with this t uh, error from the prescribed minimum point. Okay. All right, so. <clears throat> now, what does this have to do with functions of several variables? Well, first of all, there are, if we pick an initial guess, x naught, say. So sometimes, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Um, would be nice to be able to uh, to say this is these are now vectors. So x naught is an initial guess. You'd like to compute to compute x one. We need so this is this is the x naught, right? Well, to get to the next iteration, so let's say the minimum is right here, but we don't know it. We'd like to approximate it, right? So what we do is we choose a direction, and choosing the direction is, again, depends on which method you pick. But let's say we have a method of picking a direction in which to go. <coughs> For example, the steeper the stand, you would go in the direction of the gradient, uh, opposite of the gradient. And then you would pick the one Where, <clears throat> so we need to, we need a direction, say D, and then X1 is going to be in that direction. So X0 plus T times D, such that. such that um, <clears throat> the minimum of the function evaluated along that direction is achieved. Okay, so again, you restrict the function only in that direction, and then you say, I'm going to go as far as, you know, wherever the, the function reaches a bottom in that, in that direction, okay? <clears throat> and you do this like a one-dimensional problem. Now you do this, in theory, you can actually, well, assuming you can find this, the minimum to, a, to a, a, a function of one variable, then this is a function of one variable, right? Just t is the variable. <clears throat> so you can find the next, this was x1, this x1. Right? But in practice, again, you may not be able to find that, in which case you have to do some sort of a search method for one dimensional search method to pick the, the next iteration. What do you, uh, once x1 is, is determined, you would go, <coughs> you would pick a direction, a new direction, you would go in the direction of x2 and so forth, right? and so forth. Or as Germans say, und so weiter. Okay? <clears throat> um, presumably, what happens? At each iteration, you're lowering the value of f. The hope is that you can actually get to a minimum or at least, you know, to satisfy the stopping criterion where the gradient is less than, um, a prescribed error. So for instance, um, unless 
the gradient of f at x1 is already less than epsilon. If that's, if that's the case, you stop, right? And you say that's the approximate one. Choosing the direction is um, basically you have to, you know, the algorithm de uh, determines, I mean, <clears throat> picking an algorithm to choose the direction is, is again, um, something that can change from function to function. But there is the steepest descent. which would do the following. <clears throat> Stupid descent is sort of picking D, K, which I didn't use uh, K, but this is F at XK, XK, excuse me. I put them as superscripts and then subscripts, but... Um, Why is that? Why minus and why gradient? Direction is direction of maximum increase. So if you use um, uh, the derivative with respect to t of the function at, let's say, you know, a point xk plus t dk, this is a chain rule, we've done it in the past, is the gradient of f, oh, and of course evaluate at t equals zero. So, so you want to know, as I'm moving that direction, is f going to decrease? Well, it's going to decrease if this, if this derivative is negative, right? So at time zero, this is xk, of course, plus, plus t dk, but t is zero. <coughs> dotted or multiplied, because if we use this as a row, then it's just multiplication by dk, right? And this is the... Okay, I should put this as a, as a dot product here. So in the end, this is just minus the gradient of f at xk squared. And presumably this is strictly negative, otherwise... I mean, if the gradient was zero, we should have stopped, right? But if it's not zero, it means it's the length of that vector is neg strictly negative, so the derivative is negative. So you, so it means that f is decreasing in the direction of dk. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, it's the fastest decrease, direction of fastest decrease. Now, the fact that it's the direction of fastest decrease. It's not necessarily, doesn't mean this search method is the best, okay? But it is one way in which you can, you can decrease at each iteration f. Um, so, of course, there are other methods. There is, um, so this is one of them, and I'll show you in a second if, so, um, the second method would be the quasi-Newton method in which the direction is not chosen to be um, the steepest, uh, like the opposite gra gradient, but it's, it's the following. is minus the Hessian of f, I use f, the book uses g, um, at xk. This is a matrix, right? A square matrix. That's the inverse times the gradient of f at xk. Now, of course, this assumes that this has an inverse, right? And what is the Hessian having an inverse? So this works if the Hessian at xk is positive definite.
In fact, right? If it's positive definite, it means what? It means the eigenvalues are all positive. So there's a non, no, no zero eigenvalue, so it's invertible. But of course, this is best uh, if it's actually a strictly convex function altogether, because this way you don't have to check at each point you're at in your iteration, you know, a Hessian being positive definite. That's <coughs> okay. Um, if this is not the case, then there are there are ways to go around it. Um, there are other algorithms here listed. I, I don't have time to li to write them out, but. Um, also, I wanted to kind of look in the book for sort of the reason why. Why is this direction actually also decreasing f? Why the, why f is decreasing in, the, in this direction as well? Um, as I mean, it may not be the steepest descent, but you know, it may actually lead you to a faster uh, convergence. Um, so I want to end by. Um, I'm talking a little bit about that, that problem. So if the function in the sample, in the practice exam, if I have this function, we know, we know it's, it's, com, it's uh, convex, right? We know the Hessian, we know the gradient. The gradient is at a point is actually A transpose times A x minus B, right? <coughs> So, how do you actually um, apply this algorithm to solve ax equals b? Now, the first thing to say is if f is, so let's say ax equals b has a, has a solution, x star, right? And in this case, you can see that it's actually you know, the matrix is actually invertible. So it, it does have a unique solution. So it's a convex function with a unique solution that basically means it's a strictly convex function. Uh, the Hessian is strictly, is positive definite, right? There's a unique solution. <coughs> um, okay, so we're going to start with x naught we don't know, right? We don't know what it is. So uh, probably the origin, right? Doesn't matter. Start with the origin. How do we generate the first one? So choose the first direction, d1, to be what? Minus the gradient of f at x naught, right? So that's going to be minus a transposed b, right? I mean, basically it's a times 0 minus b. So it's minus a transposed b. Okay? Now with that, what are you going to do? You're going to take f in the direction of x naught plus t d1, which is just f of t d1. So this can be computed, right? a transpose b can be computed easily, right? So this is going to be a function of one variable. That's 1 half a times t d 1 minus b squared, right? And you have to minimize this. How do you minimize this? Well, this is just a function of one variable, right? So you're just taking the, I mean, it's just taking, finding the minimum of that 
parabola, sort of. So you just have to take the derivative with respect to t. Right? So this is find t1 such that, you know, the, the derivative with respect to t of f of t d1 is 0. Right? So you just have to differentiate this with respect to t and solve for t. And that will give you x1. x0 plus t1 d1. Right? So the exercise is sort of to just find the derivative in terms of t of that thing. And um, then you're going to continue by finding so x1 and then x2. And uh, in this case, I think after the final number of steps, we're actually going to get to the solution. Okay. And uh, I'll I'll let you actually you know uh, work on this as much as you can, and then um, go back on it on Wednesday. Uh, let's see, I also want, just want to um, assign some problems. Well, so let me, let me I mean, um, this is actually number five in the book. So I'll, I'm going to assign it as a homework number five. Um, number one, one. So in chapter four, number one, one. <clears throat> number five. One, that's, that's, that's this problem. And number six. And seven. And, um, I'm going to put it due Wednesday.